This is Fresh Ed, a weekly podcast that makes complex ideas and educational research easily understood. I'm your host, Will Brem. As we near the end of 2023, it's time to take stock of the year. What were the big events in 2023, and how might they impact the field of comparative and international education? What new ideas emerged, and where is our field headed in 2024? Continuing this long-standing Fresh Ed tradition, Susan Robertson and Mario Novelli join me for the last episode of the year. Mario Novelli is a professor in the political economy of education at the University of Sussex, and Susan Robertson is a professor of sociology of education at Wolfson College at the University of Cambridge. They co-edit the journal Globalization, Societies, and Education. Susan Robertson and Mario Novelli, welcome to Fresh Ed. Thanks so much, Will. It's wonderful to be back again on the edge of 2023 and just about to head into 2024. It's great to be with you again. So let's start this sort of reflection of 2023 by picking up a point that Bob Cowan mentioned in his last piece, I think, that he wrote before he passed away and that was published in Comparative Education. He mentions briefly this topic of war and how it was a silence or has been a silence in the field of comparative education. And of course, he passed away before the Gaza and Israel war broke out. But of course, he was sort of reflecting on the Ukraine war when he was making these points. How do you see this connection between war and comparative education? I guess there's two ways that you could explore this in relation to the history of comparative and international education. I would say that the first one is war could be understood as an omission from the field, precisely, I think, because the intellectual foundations of the field are located both in European imperialism and also American imperialism. So you've got kind of two, in a sense, foundational impulses for the growth and emergence of the field, um, where the purpose of the field was actually about supporting those processes of imperialism or uh, US uh, hegemony later on. And therefore, it's not surprising that war was omitted from the analysis. In a sense, that if we talk about US-led comparative and international education, in a sense, its kind of foundational mantra would be rooted around comparative advantage of Western states based around human capital theory, for example. So the reason, as Schultz would argue, the West is advanced is because it has more human capital. It's invested more in human capital. It wouldn't argue that the reason the US is most advanced is that it's invaded more countries than any other on the planet or that uh, its foundational strength is its military advantage and it, which it's happily used mm. uh, both uh, itself and also through its proxies over the years. So I guess there is that kind of sense that war is not part of the narrative of uh, comparative education for those reasons. It's a way of hiding some of the kind of foundational roots. So there you think, you know, mm. let's contrast modernization theory to, for example, dependency theory, which would argue that, you know, actually violence is at the heart of the evolution of capitalism. So that's part of it. And then the second dimension, I think, is that when war has been treated as a serious topic, which particularly since the 90s, we've seen the emergence of the field of education and emergencies, then war is something out there which we, the benevolent West, enter into and try to help to resolve. And, you know, so we have all these sets of toolkits and sets of ways of thinking about how to understand conflict in the global south, how to intervene in conflict in the global south and, uh, you know, whole literatures on peace building and post-conflict reconstruction, delivering education in the midst of war. But a lot of that, and, you know, I've been part of that story for the last two decades, a lot of that research really kind of separates itself from the conflict as if the conflicts are out there and education systems are out there and we're intervening in them, no? Which is, you know, it's a bit not dissimilar, I think, from the speech that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have talked about in the last couple of weeks where they lament the deaths of Palestinian children and women, but are silent on the fact that they just agreed 8 billion in US dollars in weaponry. So I think that, you know, that longer history 
is also about we look at the humanitarian aid that the West sends, but we don't look at the weapons that we produce and sell and deal with. No, so it's in a sense both of those dimensions. I think, reveal the hypocrisy, not only of our governments and our leaders, but also our fields, no? because we are also mm. complicit in those processes of hiding reality, pushing it down, avoiding it. And I think that, you know, many of these things, I think, are coming to the surface now. People mm. are no longer necessarily prepared to accept that narrative. They're starting to push, and I think that's creating a lot of tensions. Can I offer a slightly different vector as well? I think the comparative international education, so international takes you off on a particular vector. But let's say if we looked just at comparative education, which is a method, isn't it? We're comparing in order to make visible politics, for instance. And it's been really interesting for me in some recent work I've been doing, looking at the kinds of heuristics, let's say Mark Bray's cube and so on. And nowhere on that cube do we have a way of actually trying to understand social relations like class. And yet why wouldn't Mm. we be looking at the global south, and I mean the global south, within, in other words, um, and the kind of violence, for example, that we see. The couple of French writers, Dado and Laval, talk about this as a low-intensity class war that we've been living Mm. through, you know, and in fact we can characterise neoliberalism that way. And to some extent, I think, you know, governing by numbers numbers and these more assemblage kinds of approaches don't enable us to actually look very closely at what's going on inside our places, our spaces, our countries, you know, our our communities, cities, and so on. And so I think there's that other omission that comparative Mm. education really should address. And I imagine if we were talking to Bob now, in fact, Bob basically in one of the last pieces that I read that he wrote before he died, and he was a wonderful intellectual, was actually asking for more sociological kinds of analyses uh, there, that some of the best comparative work actually drew from a more confident social science tradition with disciplines kind of sitting at their base and so on, so that we can compare, you know, what's going on for Mm. different classes, for example, or what's going on if we look at the uneven, you know, combined and uneven development that we see characterises many places now, UK, United States, Mexico and so on. So I think that's what I'd also want to put on the table and kind of think with Bob about what would we see now when we use comparative education in a much more expansive way methodologically. Both insights are quite interesting in my mind and they, you know, I think both of you are sort of highlighting there's a politics at play and I think Susan you said that comparison can help reveal some of these politics and Mario you sort of said a lot of these politics are coming to the surface now and in sometimes in rather uncomfortable ways for a lot of people and I think this comes particularly in university campuses where there's this big issue of free speech today and, and we see countless of examples of this around the world where people are being policed in what they can or cannot say or didn't say something correctly and I just would be keen to hear from you you know in 2023 how did you navigate some of these sort of politics of free speech on your university campuses and and in sort of your intellectual lives that of course go well beyond the specific universities where you work we live in times where the global economic system even for those that it was designed to support is no longer functioning neoliberalism as an economic model seems to me to not even be providing the basics for the middle classes that it relied on to build that kind of hegemonic project so we're seeing mass movement of migrants in different parts of the world because in some places it's basically a question of life or death. I was in Miami two weeks ago, uh, stuck for 24 hours because I missed a connection. And walking around Miami, I was shocked to see the amount of homelessness and poverty in what is the, the one of the most powerful countries in the world. So in a sense, you've got a crisis of a model. So it's unsurprising to me now that suddenly there is a huge crackdown on intellectual spaces because when the West has lost its moral authority, and I think it's lost its moral authority, not now, not Palestine. Palestine is a new step. But I think since 9-11, the West has decided to tear down the rules of the international liberal order through mass violence, uh, the killing of countless thousands in Iraq and Afghanistan, the use of black sites and abductions and massive violence. And now what we see in the conflict Palestine-Israel 
in a sense, the defense of the indefensible requires actually not only uh, arguments, it also requires repression. And I think that's what we're seeing because essentially I think those that are being repressed as we speak are trying to historicize conflicts that are taking place. They're trying to tell, for example, in the Israel-Palestine issue, that you can't look at this from October the 7th and say that's where these things begin. You need, you need to take a longer purview. And that is incredibly comfortable for a country like my own that I'm sitting in, where we have to talk about the Balfour Declaration. We have to talk about the role of the British in that process. It's incredibly difficult uh, to talk about this in the United States, where the whole system seems to be linked to the U.S of Israel as its kind of watchdog in the Middle East and the fact that the Israel has been the biggest recipient of US military ha aid since its creation reflects the fact that it is a useful tool for the United States in its overall global domination processes. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of the scale of that repression, it seems to me that the US campuses have become very quickly targeted precisely because they're based much more on private capital. Private capital has much mm -hmm. more of a, a quick way a philanthropist threatens to withdraw its funding and then the next thing we know is that people start to lose their jobs there are crackdowns on campuses but one shouldn't underestimate the chilling effect that this is having also on UK campuses so difficult to talk about the issue of Palestine so difficult to mobilize um, students and staff a real sense of anxiety amongst colleagues to say anything and there there is a deep irony in this because actually those that were pushing freedom of speech were the right for so many years, arguing that the campuses were full of woke students and academics and that they were closing down free speech and we needed to open up that, those spaces for freedom of speech. Toby Young, Doug Stokes and the other group that are, are rallying for those arguments in the UK, totally silent over the last few weeks. Mm. The silence actually is deafening and I think that that exactly shows to those liberals that fell into those arguments on our campus who have accepted the new regulations of the Office for Students to regulate freedom of speech, etc. We're caught up now in a trap which actually privileges right-wing discourses and silences left-wing discourses under the banner of freedom of speech. That's the paradox, isn't it? And I think I agree with you, Mario. This year, and particularly since the beginning of October, there's been a ramping up. But this has been here, you know, well, well over 20 years. We see Prevent was prepared, but become to prevent come in in the early 2000s. There are other elements too that I think really difficult here, Will, and that includes, uh, for example, there's a kind of ramping up of the stakes of, you know, China versus the United States and the so-called West. And that's very uncomfortable for our Chinese colleagues, for example, students who feel as if they're not welcome. It's kind of a, a level of racism that includes Australia, actually. If you are a Chinese student, for instance, and you want to study in the biotech area, you're going to be strongly looked at and if not policed out of enrolments in those kinds of programs. So we have the awful, awful developments that have taken place over the last couple of months in between the Israeli state and its military and what's going on in Gaza. But, you know, you run it out the other way and have a look at the head-to-head -head competition between particularly the United States. But we shouldn't reduce it to the US. The Netherlands, Germany, all of these uh, countries have actually got a limit on the kinds of partnerships and so on that can now be set up and, and existing partnerships, finding it really difficult. Germany to China, for instance, mm. would be an example. So sticking with sort of political economy here. It seems like 2023, we also saw sort of the cost of living as a word that became sort of very well known. Everyone talks about cost of living. I think it even made the word of the year here in Australia. Of course, it's about inflation. It's about the price of goods, about the price of fuel. And I just was wondering, in your opinion, how does comparative education sort of help us think about the cost of living crisis, both within countries, but also globally? In your mind? We've already talked about the fact that there is a failure in the global economic model to deliver the basic necessities across the world to different degrees, of course, no? and that's why we have concepts like relative poverty, etc., to understand the differential nature of this crisis. We shouldn't underestimate the gaps 
in terms of all the inequalities uh, globally, as well as within countries. But we should also link those things to conflict, because it's not just the failure of the economic model, but then there is a military model or a military solution to certain conflicts that has exacerbated those tensions. No? So we take the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and that has led to massive military spending, a massive hike in energy prices, which of course has affected and exacerbated already ongoing failures of the economic model. No? And of course, education enters into that in different ways. We seem always to have enough money for weapons, always. It's always seem to be able to find those uh, weapons and find the resources for those. But we don't necessarily find those resources for public education. So when budgets are threatened, then we have to look at where it economies can be reduced and that often hits those public social sectors. So I think that education slots in there because once you're in crisis mode, then you stop to plan for the future and we're in precisely in a time where we have to look forward. No, we've got massive technological changes. We need to invest in the future and it's precisely the time when we're saying, well, we haven't got any money in public funds and mm. therefore we need to retrench or support the private sector, etc. So there is all that kind of dimension of education but you know more generally I think that this then also increases the unevenness through for example international development assistance I mean we've seen over the last few years a massive slashing of international development assistance by the UK and I've always said that we shouldn't also just look at the volumes of money but also ask the questions of where that money is going and of course the little money that is left in the UK has actually been all siphoned towards geopolitical interests so towards Ukraine towards particular political support for certain regimes at the expense of targeting to those most in need. You know? So I think that there are a range of different ways that one could link education, comparative education, and reflect on those that don't necessarily get framed in our field in those ways, no? because you know we often narrow down on the educationism and forget those kind of intersections. So, Murray, at the 2024 conference in Miami, we're having a dialogue session on tax justice, foregrounding that mm. as one of the kind of highlighted presidential sessions. And essentially, um, Wolfgang Strait put it very nicely in his book, 2014, Buying Time. We move from a tax state to a debt state, and it's families that are indebted. You know, and essentially, mm. that releases money that then gets shoved off, as Mario said, in the direction of uh, weapons and other forms of violence. But you remember remain with a kind of violence, don't you? Because essentially what you've got is kind of the rise of much more kind of precarious, low-paid jobs. In fact, actually here in the UK, the number of people who are living on quite low levels of benefits, because actually it doesn't pay to actually work. It pays to be on a fairly kind of tiny kind of state support system than to be actually out in the workplace yet. We need different comparative education, I think, in that sense, needs to challenge things like so-called graduate premium. You know, if you a concept like that, for instance, um, that's hugely distorted by what doctors and dentists and, let's say, hedge fund managers and so on earn. Mm -hmm. When you actually strip those kind of occupations out, what you see is that it probably even doesn't pay to go to university anymore. Anymore. And that's an awful shame because essentially if we've couched the way in which we think of education as a, an investment to get on in the future mm. and not an investment in knowledge, then we've got a very poverty, a, a very poor, you know, almost a kind of wizened, reduced understanding of the possibilities for education. So the concepts even that we work with in our everyday education worlds, actually mm. I think we need to really revisit those about mm. thinking of public, the public nature of education, the nature of education being a, a global public good and so on and see if we mm. can't you know lean into some of those um, different understandings and get a different conversation on the table one of the things that i find so interesting with the cost of living crisis to sort of link to what the two of you are saying some of these sort of class divides within societies and the debt for instance that a lot of people are of course taking on particularly to go to school go to university, of course, isn't felt by everybody, right? There's certain groups in society that aren't going into debt because they have a huge amount of money in their bank account. And when you have a lot of money in your bank account and interest rates go up, all of a sudden you are earning a lot more money, which sort of further exacerbates 
the inequality that pre-existed. And I think we're seeing this sort of constantly where there's this widening gap, as Mario mentioned when he was walking around Miami the other week. And so for me, it, it would be interesting to think about how then does that impact education. And one of the things that I've recently learned with an interview with Barbara Preston is about how a lot of parents pay for school fees in Australia for their children to go to private schools. But what happens is they let the grandparents pay those fees so then the the private school can get more public funding to support it. And it just distorts everything. And I feel like the cost of living crisis is just exacerbating some of these inequalities among social classes. So I want to shift gears now to something slightly different than politics and economics. Well, maybe probably a bit of both, but a slightly different focus of something that really jumped on the scene in 2023. Now, of course, probably existed before, but seemed to really come out, almost come out of nowhere this year. And that's chat GPT and artificial intelligence more broadly. You know, Susan, how do you see the challenges that chat GPT and AI more generally have or will have on education? Artificial intelligence and you know, what it's going to do to radically disrupt society has been as, with us probably since the 1950s. The uh, Much earlier, of course, but in the, the so-called what they call the Babbage machine, if you could mechanise, for example, ways of calculating, and this is partly to do with you know movements, trade movements and things like that, then you'd be able to figure out the redistribution of production and, and so on. But you're absolutely right, on the 30th of November last year, 20 2022, our open source launched what's called ChatGPT, but essentially it's a large language processing model based on pattern recognition. And there essentially, if let's say we asked it to say what's the, we could take fresh ed, um, it probably has sucked up a lot of your data in there, well, all your different conversations that you've had over the years, and it would probably be able to give you an account of broadly what are the topics that have been covered by fresh ed. I don't know if you've done this yet. Now you can see for example, that if you were a student in university, hard pressed for time, and wanted to get an, an essay done, you could say, you know, what's the difference between uh, something I did yesterday, humanitarianism and humanism. And it can spit out quite quickly what looks to be human formed kind of prose. But of course, it's not. It's recognizing patterns. And the algorithm, of course, that's at the heart of this, looks at essentially what typically, if you're looking at very large amounts of language, out there, and including also more recently more visual material, um, how do these kind of things tend to kind of come together as statements of something, of a fact? So it can tell you that humanitarianism is broadly to do with, it has a concern with human beings, but it is much more focused then on perhaps doing something about that distribution of aid, etc., whereas humanism as opposed to humanitarianism is a, a particular philosophy. So it can kind of get that right, but it can also get things badly wrong because because it's, mm. it's both sucking up huge amounts, include fake, and it's often described as a kind of um, a confident preppy student, you know, confident because it puts it out. It, it, the way it starts off the statement and concludes and so on is almost a beautifully formed undergraduate essay in a pretty well-heeled university, I would say. So, but essentially this has also now got universities, particularly in schools, kind of spinning. Does it mean, what does this mean for the kind of pedagogy that they have in forms of assessment? Does mm. What does this actually mean for even people's jobs? If we're thinking about you know, the promise that it can be a tutor, it can mark work, and so on. So China, for example, launched its own uh, version, but they're being much more modest about and managing actually who can even sign up and get a subscription there. But there's a, a war that's now brewing between the United States and and China. The AI, I'm mm. describing this as AI nationalisms, which to some extent gets in the way because artificial intelligence is many different things. It's not simply large language processing models, which is what ChatGPT is. One other thing that I would say here, I mean, it comes out of the largely unregulated tech sector in the United States. Tech's much more closely regulated and but probably deeply is problematic in China. And now mm. what we've got these AI wars, but, but particularly ChatGPT kind of wars kind of taking place. Some bit of it clawed, which is a kind of an offshoot of the ChatGPT open access version, is kind of self-styled. It's got an ethical constitution, um, but at the same time, it's a 
profit seeking corporation. Mm -hmm. So it's there's efforts to try and distinguish yourself out there. But what this does mean, I think, is we can see many papers coming up in the conference in Miami for comparative and international education, thinking about these issues. In China, every student actually has to study artificial intelligence and try and make sense of it. We do need a critical literacy around these kinds of issues to both understand its underpinning political economy, the diversity. The thing about hype is that it hides things. And the question is, what's being hidden? Where are the biases? Where are the misrecognitions? Where are the falsehoods? Um, And so on. So interesting. I use it at times as an interlocutor. But at the same time, you know, they they come with health warnings. You know, and please don't, you know, think that Elon Musk, who kind of says, well, none of us are going to have to work anymore. Now, unless we fix the economic system and have a mechanism for redistribution, you know, essentially this heightens precarity. It doesn't make yeah. it all go away. I have this dystopian dream about AI in my work at university where, you know, if students are just using AI to create these essays and there's ways of getting AI to mark those essays, that then frees me up to work with students in different ways, right? So we can get out of this like managerial neoliberal university through AI. I don't know. I keep thinking about it and how to bring it to life. Am I crazy, Mario? That sounds like a fantastic idea. So that Aristotle said, I love work. I really love it. He said, I could sit here and watch it all day. But, you know, (laughs) essentially, unless you fix the ways in which, you know, people can figure out how to live social reproduction, bottom line, then, and this means redistribution. I mean, we did see experiments and it be interesting to know what happened to those the living mm. wage you know kenya finland and others and um, again i'm not sure what the overall sense of that was but for musk you know this is a, a genie you know being let out of the bottle but we need other kinds of really insightful ways of thinking about how we can live well together and that that actually means forms of redistribution that excessive wealth that's being built up by let's say mm. a very small number in silicon valley for example it, it's mm. astonishing i mean it's eye-watering. If you think Mm. of that kind of money that just gets wasted week on week on week, you know, rockets going up to see how far you can get up. What if you put that money into Miami and people on the streets, you know? I mean, it's such an indictment of where we are as human beings. Yeah, no, I think you framed it nicely, Susan, when you say that the relationship between the kind of technological advances and the economic social model that needs to be established alongside that in order to benefit from it. And if you have one without Mm -hmm. the other, you know, that can create a great deal of fear. And of course, historically, we've always been told that the future is workless, no? That we're all going to sit around finding complicated ways to enjoy our leisure time, but that never quite comes, no? We just keep having the intensification of labor precisely for those reasons but you know clearly there are massive implications in terms of changing nature of labor relations within the education system which you know Mm. as you've written so much about uh, both of you around the kind of global education industry clearly that's going to affect it massively i was just looking at new language learning possibilities of chat gpt where you can have a kind of online interlocutor who will talk to you in any language that you choose and so you can imagine a whole industry of language teaching the British Council shaking in its boots there because its model is so based around the spread of English but you know Maria when it goes wrong so I'll give you an example it's not an education example but you could see but there, and there is an education example when they ran the algorithm to do with allocation of student marks just toward the end of COVID but the other example here is what's called the post office scandal and it's an algorithm that was incorrect and it begins to actually identify and accuse post office masters and mistresses of infidelity to do with money and about 700 lost their jobs. Now this was the problem of the algorithm and this is still only 90 people have ever um, had the charges dropped. A further what 600 or so people have still got charges against them. Some have died, some have had periods of time in prison, others their families have been completely destroyed, their livelihoods lost. Now that's an algorithm that was wrong and the post office Mm -hmm. refused to accept when it begins to see a patterning here that in fact actually somehow they'd 
got a technological kind of no. problem that they were facing. This was constantly then and continues to be presented as a people problem. And I think that stands as a really interesting example of when things go wrong. So let's now we've got a marking kind of system here because there's a view that there are, there are products out there that teachers are even using right now. But what if it gets it wrong? I mean, the stakes and the costs in education, it's your future or not, the way education worlds now operate. That would be significant. And I think the other dimension is this, which I think you alluded to, but maybe needs to be fleshed out, is the, the repository of knowledge upon which chat GPT draws upon reflects global inequalities in knowledge production, knowledge yeah. making, no? and we'll reproduce those. So I think there was a, a short TikTok video around somebody asking GPT, chat GPT, if Israelis and then later Palestinians deserve the right to their own nation and to be free. And uh, on the question of Israel was all people have a right to be free. And when it came to Palestinians, it said, this is a complicated question <laughs> that requires a lot of of, you know, so it reflects the way that these issues have been framed historically. And then we think about the hegemony of the English language, the hegemony of certain ways of thinking and framing, the lack of an ecology of knowledge in our, our global knowledge making world, which all tend to produce kind of a narrowing down rather than a kind of opening up, which I think needs to be challenged. And again, you know, that's the importance of pushing for a more plural global governance regime, yeah, because we've been so dominated by one particular Western hegemonic kind of leadership, particularly since the end of the Cold War, that all of these innovations kind of filter themselves through that. And, you know, if we want to kind of have a diversity of thought, we need a diversity of governance. We need more voices. No, we need more general assemblies and less security councils, I think. Just on that, just a very quick way of finishing that. Ada Lovelace, who writes the first algorithm for computers, basically said, the algorithm only does what we ask it to do. And it doesn't do anything yeah. more or anything less. It doesn't run off and do all these other things that we're not aware of. So this is a human invention and, and we have to understand the consequences. You know, So the hype um, and so on needs to be pierced, it seems to me. We need to kind of explode that and have wide-ranging conversations that are much more nuanced. Mm. I totally agree. And I just read this Nature article about these mathematicians who solve a pure mathematics problem that has gone unsolved for you know decades or centuries or forever, I should say, called the comp set problem. And it was solved through artificial intelligence. They created these models that trained each other and they basically, they solved the problem. I mean, so it's sort of like everything you said, all of the sort of, you know, don't believe the hype or, or look beyond the hype and all the inequalities that happen, that it's human systems, all the biases, you know, all of that is true. And this other side is true that we are able to do something that has never been done before by humans before. Um, and I think that creates even more sort of complexity around this issue. Absolutely. Partly because it's based mm -hmm. on algebra, and algebra, which is a an Arabic Hindu, it's not an abacus; it's an it's algebra. And algebra actually has a capacity to work with very large numbers, but in a very parsimonious kind of way because of the way mm -hmm. in which algebra itself actually works. Now, then you add computing power to that, and you've got something startling. But we shouldn't also think that this is neutral. The cost, the sheer cost, computing costs. I mean, energy. Okay, let's just call it energy costs to do this are astonishing. So you know we euphemistically say, well, it's all up in the cloud. But of course, it's not up in the cloud. These are physical infrastructures mm. that sit in places like Greenland to cool down their computing and, and so on. Um, these are voracious. And the, the minute we begin to think that this is kind of like a, a horizon that's going to go on forever with no limits, it, we're just walking into another climate yeah. kind of issue. Yeah, Neil Selwyn gave a great talk at the AARE conference in Melbourne this year. And when he talked about AI, he said it's socially unsustainable and environmentally unsustainable. I totally agree with him. 
and you know he sort of says he would love to just put the genie back in the bottle and not have to deal with it. Let's turn to, I guess we're probably not going to be able to get through every topic that we had planned for today, but I really would love to give listeners some sort of reading recommendations. You know, what have you been reading in 2023? What would be a recommendation that you could give the audience of, of a book that really hit home to you and you think you'll be using into the future going forward? Two books that I read this year that kind of slip into my vocabulary a bit and um, framing. Um, one was Nancy Fraser's Cannibal Capitalism that I really enjoy and I think helps us to kind of understand precisely this kind of crisis that we were talking about, no? which, mm. you know, builds on all of the critiques of neoliberalism that we've had for, for several decades and that, you know, we've all tried to contribute to in education, but also frames it in quite interesting ways to, to show its irrationality. So this kind of cannibal capitalism idea, I think, was useful. And then the second book that I've really enjoyed and, and I think helps to frame some contemporary issues is uh, Olufemi Taiwo's uh, Against decolonization, which in a sense coming from a kind of African critique of the decolonization discourse to show the ways that if decolonization is used as this kind of totalizing discourse, it often kind of undermines African agency, African histories. Now it's like, you know, I'll give some simple examples. If you believe that everything that is emerged out of your society is a result of colonialism, it in a sense denies you a prehistory, but it also denies kind of your own agency, you know. So um, I don't necessarily agree with everything that Olufemi Taiwo's believes in that, but I think it's been a useful antidote to a kind of new hegemonic language which, like many theories and many frames, doesn't tell the whole story and we need to open that up now. Just as kind of, for example, dependency theory with its emphasis on the role of US imperialism and Western imperialism in, in growth often kind of hid the nefarious role of endogenous uh, capitalist classes within the societies and that you needed to open up that. So I think that Olufemi's work and others is opening up a kind of new way to diversify and complexify the discourses of decolonization and to also link them up and open them up um, because you get a sense sometimes that people think that decolonization kind of emerges out of post-colonial theory you know, and that there is no previous decolonial struggle and decolonial thinkers that actually did the real struggle of e ejecting uh, Western nations out of their occupied countries. You know? So those two books yeah, have been important. Susan, what about you? Yeah, I read Nancy Fraser's book and was very excited by the book Cannibal Capitalism. But it's a manifesto and the so here's what I've been trying to do in my own work. And I've been trying to understand using a kind of a Marxist kind of language, the making of markets and how to begin to think about that. And if you read Nancy, essentially the world of education is still in the hidden abode. You know, Marx talked about, you know, the hidden abode being, you know, the private home space. Um and, and Nancy places it there. Now, in the world I live in, it's definitely not there. It's uh, driven by knowledge economy discourses, but it generates significant revenues and things like that. And so the book that I'm going to say really does give us a much more sophisticated language to try and understand the things that I'm trying to understand around the capitalising of education and drawing it into the economy as a form of imperialism to think with um, Rosa Luxemburg is Soren Mao's book called Mute Compulsion and it's an amazing book he, it was his PhD uh, beautifully written actually very clear um, and there are issues and so on but what Mao is trying to do in this is to add another more of a kind of complicated lexicon mute compulsion essentially is once you can get markets kind of working for example um and then then they kind of objective they kind of tick over but they are a form of domination and he, he kind of compares it you know on the one hand we tend to think of ideology or we tend to think of violence but what's quite exciting about this book actually is also that what they're trying to do actually is to look at social reproduction so draws on new social reproduction theory 
history, as, and but also is telling us that Marx didn't get it right at that time. Okay, he's thinking about industrial Britain in the nineteenth century. So what we need to do is not to stick with a language, a Marxist language, as if you know, like a, a fundamentalist would, but to bring mm. Marx into the world of today and to try and understand our worlds that we're both living in mm. and do the kind of development work on some of the Marxist kind of categories and concepts that actually fit us out better for the kind of, you know, let's go back to the beginning of where Mario started, you know, a kind of a system, as Nancy Fraser is kind of describing it to us, that, that in fact is rapacious, you know, it, it devours things, nature, uh, human beings, to some extent it's not that different from the kind of argument that also Saskia Sasson was putting around expulsion. That would be one of my favourite books. Yeah, we've had a reading group on it and it's well worth reading for what we'll get from it. Excellent. The only two I'll add is uh, I would add to the reading list that we are creating for Fresh Ed listeners is Crack Up Capitalism by Quinn Slobodian and his focus on zones, I think, is really helpful for comparative educationalists to get out of that nation state sort of thinking. And I think it can be quite useful for all of us sort of going forward into 2024. And then the other one is a name of a philosopher, cultural theorist that I've recently come across this year, but a lot of his work was written in German and has only recently been translated. And so I've been going through his books. His name is Byung Chol Han, and he basically updates a lot of Foucauldian thought sort of around biopolitics to what he's now calling psychopolitics. And he has this fantastic book that became a huge hit in Korea called Burnout Society. And I think there's a lot of overlaps with education generally, comparative education specifically, that I would love to see scholars take up and, and push forward into 2024. So I guess that sort of brings us to the last question of the year, which is, what are we looking forward to 2024? Susan, I know the conference that you have been organizing and Mario has been helping. The conference, of course, is in 2024, but give me a sense of, of what 2024 looks like to you and what you are looking forward to. So, yeah, there's a big uh, undertaking, actually. The Comparative International Education Society will be in my Miami in March. Its theme is called The Power of Protest. And I must say, I'm just absolutely blown over by the engagement with the theme. I mean, of course, it's going to trigger difficult conversations, but in a way, I'm glad that, in fact, we don't have an anodyne theme, that, in fact, actually, mm -hmm. if that society is to do its work, it's got to be able to learn to come together, to have those difficult conversations, to learn to listen, to do the kind of dialogical work that Freire kind of calls us to do. So I'm hoping that the conference will Will be there will be artistic performances going on over the course. Burrowoy will be Michael Burrow will be speaking. He's been deeply involved in some uh, work at Berkeley around mm -hmm. education and protests and so on. So from 2023, I want to welcome everyone to Miami and do what Mario said. You know, walk around the streets and get a, a, a sense. Don't stay in a hotel. Mm -hmm. Get a sense of actually what a kind of topography begins to feel like when life's chances are not equally shared at all. Like any stretch of the imagination. And Mario, what are you looking forward to in 2024? Yeah, well, definitely looking forward to that conference. And, you know, I think I agree that the world is so full of tension and complexity and, and conflict at the moment that we really need to find spaces where those discussions can take place. And we need to push back against censorship and hegemonic control of certain debates and certain ideas. So I think that, um, great that CIS is going ahead. Complex. I think Miami and the politics of that city are deeply troubling and I think we're in a time, a period of history that's also deeply troubling. So it's full of tensions, but you know, I think that we have to continue to talk, continue to dialogue, continue to fight for the importance of ideas, the importance of aspirations. And, you know, we have a responsibility not only to our colleagues, but also to new generations of scholars to be critical, to raise issues, to be brave in these periods. Now, I think more than ever, we need to do that. So that's definitely one event that's going to be important. What else am I looking forward to? We have a, in terms of the journal, we have a number of new new special issues coming through uh, 
Um, we've just had uh, Aziz Chowdhury's special issue out, which I think mm. is really important. We have another one on education in emergencies and the ethics around that. I think with the issue of Palestine, that is a really poignant special issue that reflects on some of these dynamics and the way that we as comparative education specialists get entangled in other people's imperial plans or sometimes uh, construct our own. And so I think those are areas. And then we also have another special issue coming free around teachers and teachers' trade unions and labour. So looking forward to those. And can I add also one on Paulo Freire, the global educator, because that was recognition of 100 years of his date of birth, actually. I mean, I'm absolutely buoyed by the way in which the, our young scholars, despite the challenges that they're facing, engage and continue mm. to raise important issues. So, and, and our job is to support any of those kinds of activities. So, yeah, 2024, it'll be different, but let's hope it, it's something to look forward to as well. Well, Susan Robertson, Mario Novelli, thank you so much for joining the last episode episode of 2023. I wish you a happy new year, a brave new year, and I look forward to seeing both of you in Miami. Thank you so much, Will. Great pleasure to be with you. Take care. Mario Novelli is a professor at the University of Sussex, and Susan Robertson is a professor at Wolfson College, University of Cambridge. A transcript of today's interview with a selection of resources for further exploration can be found at freshedpodcast.com. Please note that opinions expressed on Fresh Ed are solely those of the host or the guest interviewed, not Fresh Ed, which takes no institutional position. If you've liked what you've heard today, please rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews really do help. Fresh Ed's team includes Fatih Octus, Oba Femi Angunle, Annabella Afroboteng, Phyllis Che Mensa, and Jose Neto. Original music for Fresh Ed was created by Digital Primate. Fresh Ed is an independently run podcast without advertisements and is made possible by the support of NORAG, the Shock Dev Family Fund, and listeners like you. Please consider donating to Fresh Ed by visiting freshedpodcast.com slash donate. Thanks for listening. I'm Will Brem, and I'll be back next year 